nuclear movies or nuclear secrecy. Nowadays, we take it for granted that any kind of nuclear anything will be cloaked, hidden from public view, and it will take years, if not decades, if ever, before an uncomfortable nuclear truth is revealed. And by that time, a veritable army of nuclear defenders armed with calculated talking points will undercut our awareness and muddy the waters so that the last thing we the people will know is the nuclear truth. But it almost wasn't that way. When you hear a genuine expert tell you that in the early 1950s, President Dwight Eisenhower considered a different route, and you hear... Very early in his administration, and he was largely moving in that position of, we're just going to let the world know, we're going to let the American public know just how destructive these things are, including radiation. We're not going to hide what we're doing. Ultimately, that argument was overcome, was defeated by another argument, which is we can't do that because people will freak out and they will panic. Yeah, think. Well, for a brief window of time in the early 1950s, we might have learned the truth about nuclear weapons and thus been able to stop their proliferation. But instead, to prevent an appropriate mass emotional response to the horrors being unleashed on the world, the powers that be just silently shoved us into that uncomfortable, unavoidable seat that we unfortunately all share. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halnevy. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, in an astonishing interview... We learn about the U.S. government's secret Hollywood studio that for 20 years not only filmed nuclear above-ground blasts and turned them into pro-nuke propaganda, but cranked out other images and films that the government used to manipulate nuclear consent during the coldest of the Cold War. We talk at length with Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman, authors of Look Out America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War. It's a whole new take on how we've been manipulated into believing what we believe, or think we believe, about nukes. We'll also have numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness and more honest nuclear information than most of the Democrats running for the nomination have been exposed to. Today is Tuesday, September 17, 2019, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. In Japan... Newly appointed Japanese Environment Minister Shinjiro Koizumi has called for nuclear reactors to be scrapped rather than restarted after Fukushima. He said, I would like to study how we will scrap them, not how to retain them. We will be doomed if we allow another nuclear accident to occur. We never know when we'll have another earthquake. Former Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama says radioactive contamination from Fukushima is not under control and warns that athletes who participate in the Olympic Games should not be contaminated by radioactivity. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's on a week. Pro-nuke shill paper Forbes is at it again, with the ever-condescending James Conka Conka Conga. That's the nuclear whack-a-mole dance telling we silly gooses that, to quote his headline, it's really okay if Japan dumps radioactive Fukushima water in the ocean. No, it is not. 1,400 words of techno-gobbledygook justification follow 
all to convince investors to keep shoveling money into nuclear reactors worldwide because, hey, you make lots of money with no consequences to health or the environment because everyone knows the ocean is a big garbage dump and what's a little radioactive tritium in your sushi? You say it's okay to dump Fukushima radioactive water into the ocean? How white of you, James. And that's why you, James Kanka Kanga Kanga, are again this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. In France, at least five nuclear reactors operated by French utility EDF might have problems with weldings on their steam generators, a fault which has raised fears of radiological accidents or closures. But there are no plans to shut down the reactors involved for the time being. EDF has exported them to China, Finland, South Africa, and South Korea, with Britain also set to use this equipment. In Russia, following up on the August 8 explosion, of the five Russian scientists killed in the blast during a weapons test near Nyonska, two victims died from radiation poisoning rather than from the blast, and a hospital bath was so contaminated it had to be secretly removed. Kremlin says it had nothing to do with the testing of nuclear weapons. U.S. nuclear experts insist the blast did come from Russia Skyfall missile test and will probably never know the full truth. And in the U.S., in Piketon, Ohio, the Zahn's Corner Middle School has been quarantined over contamination concerns. Cancer-causing toxins, including radioactive plutonium, neptunium, americium, and uranium, were all detected on the property, likely from the U.S. Department of Energy's decommissioning and disposal of radioactive materials from the former Portsmouth Gaseous Diffusion Plant about three miles from the school. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, hey, I've got a birthday coming up. And it's a big one. Yep, one of those that ends in a zero and begins with a, well, let's just say a large enough number that it makes me wonder how that ever happened. I've decided to celebrate for a full two months, which takes the pressure off making any one day super significant. It also extends the period of time in which you can help me celebrate. I am open to kind words, atta girls, Facebook posts and memes, and of course, donations to support Nuclear Hot Seed. In fact, I'm using this opportunity to reach out to any of you who might be inclined to send a donation to the show to do so in honor of my decades of life and activism. You know you depend on Nuclear Hot Seed as the gift that keeps on giving all year long. Information, attitude, actions you can take, and just some commiseration that you're not alone with your perceptions and fears about the nuclear menace. Yes, it's true that we are all in that nuclear hot seat, and the best defense against it is to know exactly what's going on and how to resist its spread. So I'm rededicating myself to moving into a new decade of life with nuclear hot seat as my vehicle. To do that, I need your help. So let's get together and throw a no-nukes party as I continue in the ninth year of sharing with you interviews with activists, authors, like today's dynamic duo, genuine experts who contradict the state-approved narrative, numbnuts of the week, and all our regular features. So come on, help out a young old hippie lady journalist on the anti-nuclear circuit. It's easy. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button for a donation of any size, or to send us a monthly $5, same as a cup of coffee and a good tip here in the U.S., click on the big green donate button at nuclearhotseat.com. Please do what you can now, and I'll light a candle on that cake for you. It's the only meltdown I allow. Here's this week's featured interview. We've all seen those powerful black-and-white films of atmospheric nuclear bomb tests, most notably in the montage at the end of the film Dr. Strangelove. But did you ever stop to think where those films came from? Who shot that footage? And why? I know I didn't, until I read my alma mater's newsletter and discovered a new book with a nuclear premise that blew me away. It's called Look Out America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War. And the book was written by two professors from the University of Illinois, Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman. What they uncovered during their 10 years of research is the mind-blowing saga of a hidden propaganda arm of the U.S. military, 
And it explains a lot about how U.S. beliefs about nuclear weaponry were developed and implanted in the populace. I could barely contain my excitement when we finally had the opportunity to talk on September 6, 2019. Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman, thank you so much for joining us here on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having us on. We're glad to be here, Libby. Yeah, really glad to be here. Thank you. I can't begin to tell you how I've been eagerly anticipating this interview. Let's start out with a little bit about the two of you. What are your backgrounds? Kevin, you take it. So I come from a fine arts background, Libby. I was trained as an artist who had a focus on public art and public memory. And I came to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign in 2002 to come as an art professor and teach people how to address these big issues of how we understand what's happened in the past through art, through digital media. And as I started working here and finding good collaborators like Ned, I started working more and more as a scholar as well as as an artist. And how did you switch over to doing media work or communications work? That really happened in large part because of when I came out of school and because of my interests. I really followed a path from art that was primarily about image making and how images work into a world that uh, in the early digital revolution was really turning upside down that way. And I started to apply my questions I had about how images work and how people have made images over the centuries to our new digital technologies and the new social connections that they afford. Ned, how about you? How did you come to this conversation? Yeah, I'm a professor in a communication department, and my research and work over the last decade and a half is tacked back and forth between history, specifically the history of the Cold War, and philosophy, philosophy of communication, of public discourse, on how publics get motivated or discouraged, how they get informed or misinformed. And so the Cold War has been a great place for me with respect to both of those, you know, the history part, but as well as the more sort of philosophical questions, because it was a time when a lot of major historical importance was happening across the globe. And there were a lot of ways in which publics were uh, misinformed about what was taking place. Who first became aware of Lookout Mountain Studios and how did that happen? This is Ned, and I was working on my first book, which was on President Eisenhower and the Eisenhower administration, focused in specifically on nuclear weapons and on nuclear weapons discourse. And I came across a memo when I was doing research there at the Eisenhower Library about a film that President Eisenhower had watched there in the White House. And when he finished watching it, uh, he turned to his staff and he said, every American should see this film. And it was a film about the first test of a thermonuclear device in the Pacific in 1952, done by the United States. It turns out that film was made by Lookout Mountain Laboratory. So that's what got me keyed into it. And from there, Kevin and I started um, what ended up being a decade's worth of research into the history of this particularly unusual Hollywood studio. How did you proceed with your research? Because certainly within the movement of people who oppose nuclear, there has been no awareness of this studio. So where did you go? What were you looking for? And how difficult was it to find? We learned the studio's name through the credits, and they don't actually credit themselves for many of their films, but for some of those early ones, they did. And once we started looking around for mentions of this, really one of the first places we came to was the Department of Energy, of all places, who uh, had released uh, just a one-page PDF that they put up online and probably gave out in printed copies somewhere at some of their sites about Lookout Mountain Laboratories. It turns out to contain a lot of inaccurate information, but that, that was our first little nugget. And where that took us was to the declassification efforts that had started in the 90s with the Clinton administration, out of which that little bit of information had come and some of the films that had been declassified at that time. Did you have to go FOIA in order to get the information, Freedom of Information Act requests? You know, once we started seeing what was already out there early on in this project, we made a decision to try to uncover as much as we could without FOIA. And that really became a commitment early on, just as a way to prove what you could tell 
that had been hiding in plain sight in a way. Taking a look at Lookout Mountain, from the start, what was its mandate and what was it created to document? Yeah, it was created to document nuclear tests, primarily tests that were taking place in the late 1940s in the Pacific. Operation Sandstone uh, was the first test that they were charged with documenting. It was a highly secretive affair. This film, the footage, as well as the documentary products that they produced out of the footage were classified. They were meant for Atomic Energy Commission officials, for the Pentagon, for the White House, for Congress, and in certain cases, for personnel who would be working in these operations to inform them uh, what to expect and how to best prepare for the experience of taking part in a nuclear test. And Levy, some of what was happening there early on was just the logistics of secrecy. They knew they needed photographic documentation of these tests, but they also knew that it was really easy, a photographic project, a film project, to end up getting out of hand if they had to go process the film in one place and edit it in another employ different photographers from another source to actually shoot the thing. And they really decided, you know, what we need is a one-stop shot. We need a place we, we know is all on lockdown where the photographers start, they do their work, they come back, they develop, and the work gets produced for its audiences. So Lookout Mountain was really a consolidation of efforts that were already taking place under the aegis of the government to document nukes. Is that accurate? Yeah, you know, to call it a consolidation maybe gets a little ahead of things. Look how Mountain really came to be just as the nuclear weapons testing itself was, a program itself was coming to be. Immediately after the war, you had a kind of spectacle test known as Operation Crossroads, and that was open to the press. But once uh, under the Truman administration, the United States government got serious about developing more powerful and more destructive nuclear weapons, they immediately began to think about how were they going to document these events on film. And that's where Lookout Mountain came in at that point. So it was sort of right there at the beginning. And you can think about it as coming out of the Air Force, which, of course, was already in the business of photography, if not least from the perspective of assessing bombing impacts in World War II, right? So it took photography to identify targets and then photography to evaluate the damage and so a lot of the early photographers there in Lookout Mountain's early stages, of course, were coming from the Air Force. But the sheer size of these projects required that they also hire civilian photographers. And by our research, it really seems to be less a consolidation than maybe a formalization where uh, the government saw that it needed to take an operation that had been partly managed by the Air Force but dipping into civilian realms and really formalize it into something they could say was working on its own. So it was an entity unto itself, but it was directly dependent upon and answerable to elements in the military, the government? Yes, it was officially part of the Air Force. But it was strangely answerable primarily to the Atomic Energy Commission. And this is something that took some finagling on the part of the leadership of Lookout Mountain, But in the early 1950s, they successfully, even though it was a military outfit, at least in leadership, they wrested free the chain of command and uh, came under more or less the authority of the Atomic Energy Commission because they were just so uh, intertwined into the nuclear testing operations. And it was really the ADC that was managing these operations. Taking a step back to look at the studios itself before we go deeper into the nuclear part of the issues, there were many Hollywood big names. They had to hire the technicians and the hands-on people, but there were also many major people from Hollywood who became involved with Lookout Mountain, including Walt Disney, Jimmy Stewart, John Ford, Susan Hayward, and Marilyn Monroe. Taking just one example, while we do think of Marilyn as a bombshell of the blonde variety, What did she have to do with films about nuclear bombs? They brought Marilyn in ahead of a really big test they were working on called Operation Castle, which is probably familiar to your listeners as the largest nuclear disaster from the 
That was Castle Bravo, wasn't it? It's sometimes right. referred to that way, yeah. Yes. And what had been happening in previous tests was that the huge workforce required to essentially build uh, new from scratch labs out in the Marshall Islands to run these tests. These workforce had not been keeping their stories uh, under wraps. They were riding home. They were telling their family and friends what they were up to out there. And after Lookout Mountain had already established itself as a credible uh, storyteller about the tests to classify audiences and to government audiences, they said, you know, maybe y'all can help us with the secrecy problem. So the studio came up with the idea that maybe they could cut some short films, some trailers, really, that would be put in front of the films that soldiers were looking at as part of their R&R &R that would encourage them to keep their work to themselves. And so they filmed Marilyn Monroe looking into the camera and encouraging them to keep what they were doing secret in that way. I've written a lot, including a full play about Marilyn Monroe, done a lot of research into her life, and never came across that particular factoid. It's a really interesting story, and we didn't know how she got there until we dived into this a little deeper. We ended up finding the way that she got there through our interaction with the descendants of Harold Lloyd, the silent film star, which really became one of the main connections by which she got hooked up with the lab. They actually filmed her on Harold Lloyd's estate. And there's a longer story to tell here that's, that we've actually uh, told with another journalist. It's been published in a California publication called Alta. Well, we'll get a link to that so that people can check it out. Moving this along, the films that were created by Lookout Mountain told stories of the bomb as a controlled physical and political instrument for a variety of audiences, enthusiastic technophiles, skeptical decision makers, aggressive generals, mystified military personnel, and eventually a wary public. What kind of impact was intended by the films and what kind of impact did they actually have? It's a hard question to answer because there were so many films doing so many different things for so many different kinds of audiences. But in the 1950s, which was the peak of above ground nuclear testing, clearly Lookout Mountain intended to make films that were going to cause audiences to be overwhelmed and perhaps overawed by the spectacle of a nuclear blast and at the same time to say despite the overpowering sight before your eyes we that is the atomic energy commission and the department of defense have this under total control and so there's no reason ultimately to fear what we are doing the only thing that we really need to fear is what the soviets are doing Let's take a look at Lookout Mountain's role in Operation Ivy, which you referenced earlier, Ned. It was America's first thermonuclear device, and it's considered to be what inaugurated the age of thermonuclear weapons. You state in the book that, quote, it was not really the device itself that did the inaugurating of the age of thermonuclear weapons, but rather its fantastic images. So talk to us about Project Ivy, what those images were, and what the resulting film led to. That film really was what started our whole project in many ways, really diving into that film and asking questions about why it told the story the way it did and how it came to be the way it was, and even how there came to be different versions out there, different edited versions uh, over the years. And what we saw there was that this was a film in which the, the makers and the commissioners, the clients, as it were, knew that this was going to be a game changer. This was really going to be what they would call historic. And yet they needed to both claim the new authority that being the first across that line would give them without making it look like something was out of their control. Because, of course, from many of our perspectives, it might be historic in a way that is a, a, a direction we don't want to go, a direction that would seem to be spinning out of control, that could be igniting the whole atmosphere on fire. These kinds of questions were still on people's minds about what might happen with a test this big. And so the film that they made was a highly scripted film. It was the first film they made that used an on-camera narrator for which they secured a known television face, a trusted face, 
that walked us through there as if we were there, as if we were counting down, as if we were right there waiting for history to happen. That was the approach anyway. But this was, of course, a very different story once the test happened and images started actually appearing uh, to folks back in Washington. And what ended up getting out in front of the public is a different story. Why was it a different story and how was it different? The film itself really became the primary object about which people in the government argued <laughs> and debated. It wasn't the thermonuclear weapons program. It wasn't the, the IV test. It was this film that was shot about it that caused people in civilian defense to argue with people in the Atomic Energy Commission, to argue with people in the Pentagon, and for the White House to have to mediate and all these arguments. And at the heart of the argument was, when should we tell the world about this? And what should we tell the world about this? And the film became the way in which these debates were sort of hashed out over an 18-month period when finally the Castle Bravo incident happened before the IB film was released publicly. And uh, by that time, everybody in the world knew, anybody who was paying attention knew that the United States was engaged in a thermonuclear weapons program and taking us into an entirely new era in nuclear weapons history. Now, I understand that it was President Eisenhower who said, let's show this to the public, when he said that everyone in the country should see it. How was the film distributed and shown to the public? And what, if anything, was the general response to it? The result of all the deliberations and arguments that it was talking about was the film getting sent back to look at Mountain for new edits, and even the filming of new introductions. And the first folks to end up seeing this film outside the inner circle who saw the full-length film not too long after the test itself was actually a council of mayors that Eisenhower had convened. And a much shorter version, a 20-minute version of this film was screened for them as a first step here and as a kind of uh, almost resolution to the arguments. From there, that version of the film, the much reduced version of the film, did end up getting screened for Congress and eventually screened across theater screens across America and on television. And the response was mixed in all those audiences. We can read television reviewers uh, and their comments about the film. We can read what the mayors themselves said about the film. And some of these responses are indicative of maybe a, a story in which they saw the technical aspect of the story getting so foregrounded that they were sort of lost a sense of what else was happening there. The film itself, I think even for audiences at the time, read as a little over the top for, for some folks. Did it just show the explosion as a marvelous piece of technology that had been developed? Or was there any reference at all to what the human toll would be if such a bomb were exploded in a populated area? There was quite a bit of attention in the film, both in the full version of the film and even in the shorter edited versions of the film that were made for the public or for the mayors that detailed on maps um, what would happen to the city of New York if this bomb was dropped on it or what would happen to the city of Washington, D.C. if this bomb were dropped on it. And so there was attention to the human cost, we might say, but it was a kind of graphical attention. That is to say, it was a view from the sky. It depended upon maps. Uh, we didn't see actual humans or really hear any stories about the kinds of sufferings that even the Marshallese themselves were undergoing at that time due to America's nuclear weapons testing program. So attention to the human cost, but a very carefully crafted kind of attention to it. Was there any discussion at all of radiation releases from such a bomb and what the aftermath of the radiation would be? The focus of the Operation Ivy films when they tried to communicate the, the size of the blast were more on how deep the crater was or how wide the blast radius would be. And some of your listeners probably are, have seen some of these bomb blast radius detectors, the calculators that the, that the civil defense people distributed at the time. And that's 
that's the kind of approach that this took. It really didn't focus on the radiation piece. It focused on the, the yield of the blast as a kind of measurable geographic size. We need to get into the ethics of what Lookout Mountain was doing. During the Depression in 1938, the Farm Security Administration produced the film The River, which was about the Mississippi River. I actually saw it when I was at the University of Illinois in one of the journalism classes. And this was such a powerful film about how farming and timber practices led directly to soil loss, catastrophic floods, and impoverishing the farmers that the program that produced it was discontinued shortly thereafter. There was a fear that it was just going to produce more New Deal propaganda to sway the public in the direction of whatever the administration wanted. So there is a decision to separate government from the making of films. And yet after the war, that's exactly what the government did with Lookout Mountain. How was that justified? I think part of the justification was more broadly cultural. And what I mean by that is that during World War II, as well as in the years after World War II, Hollywood itself really moved to the center in so many ways of American popular culture. And I think that part of the justification was a desire that is perennially true on the part of uh, the state or on the part of the federal government to try to make sure they're connecting with people where people feel connected with, if you get what I'm saying. Today, it might be social media or Twitter, right? But then it was Hollywood. And so I think part of the government's justification for aggressively pursuing a film operation in Hollywood was Hollywood is kind of where the cultural action was, and they felt as though this is where they needed to be able to connect with people. From your perspective as communications professors for a major university, what are the ethical problems that were or might be posed by this kind of connection between the government and the film industry, let alone having their own studio? You know, I think to go into that in relationship to the, the work we've been looking at, I think it'd be most interesting to look at the kind of exchanges and quid pro quos that were going on between Lookout Mountain and the industry itself. Because when you look at things like how when there was a fire in the sound studio there at Lookout Mountain Laboratory on Wonderland Avenue, Walt Disney was happy to let them come down the mountain there from Laurel Canyon and use the sound studios down at Disney Studios. Early CinemaScope technology, even before film like The Robe came out, that, that technology was already in use by the Air Force. You don't see a blockbuster film that includes military technology in which there hasn't been a lot of consultation and maybe even loaned equipment from the Pentagon. And I think that relationship there and what's happening there across an exchange, mutual influence, uh, discovery of shared rhetorics and stories and iconographies uh, is where I would look uh, for that conversation. Yeah, and if I could add another dimension to the ethics of all this, there was actually in and around uh, 1950, a really, really interesting debate happening at the level of the White House. And this is in the late Truman years going into the early Eisenhower years. And that was a debate that was typically called the debate about candor. How candid should we be with the American public and the world about nuclear weapons and the kind of destruction that they could do and the kinds of activities the United States is uh, engaged in with respect to making them even more destructive? And there was a substantial wing in the highest levels of the federal government making arguments that we really just need to be upfront with people about this. We shouldn't sort of whitewash it. We shouldn't dress it up. We just need to tell them the facts. And Robert Oppenheimer was at the forefront of making this case, ultimately unsuccessfully, but it was part of what got Eisenhower's ear very early in his administration. And he was largely moving in that direction. That is, towards this position of we're just going to let the world know, we're going to let the American public know just how destructive these things are, including radiation, and we're going to be candid. We're not going to hide what we're doing. 
ultimately, that argument, which Oppenheimer represented and Eisenhower for a time embraced, was overcome, was defeated by another argument, which is we can't do that because people will freak out and they will panic. That was the word that was used. People will panic. And then we will have a situation where we have mass hysteria about this. And that's no way to run a society, was the counter argument. So you can see there, there really is an ethical argument about the nature of the public, about the capacities of the public to know, and what is the responsibility of the government to the public when it comes to some of the more dangerous activities in which the government is engaging. I think one other ethical dimension that I think we could look at about Hookup Mountain's work is looking at their role in the identification of the test sites as disposable and the ways in which when Lookout Mountain borrowed from Hollywood ways of looking at things, Hollywood rhetorics and, and symbols, they really helped build a whole view of the Pacific, a whole view of what we might even think of as, as tiki culture and, and that kind of uh, depiction of the Pacific as sort of outside of history, where one island's as good as another. It's a you know, mostly populated by palm trees and people that don't really care about which island they're on. I mean, that this was the basis by which these folks were removed and irradiated in many ways was by their depiction as less than human and depiction of these oceans, these waters, these lands as replaceable. I think that's another place we could go here would be the ethics of representation in that. I don't know if you're familiar with the film Nuclear Savage. Have you seen it? I have, yes. For those who aren't familiar with it, it is about the bombing of the Marshall Islands and what was done to the natives there, the lies they were told, and the way that it was used as almost a Mangala-type laboratory, not to give healing and treatment to the people who were subjected to the bombs, but to just track what happened to them as a result so that we would have some data on exposure to radiation and what it did to people, which of course is, is environmental genocide and environmental racism. Absolutely. It's one of the motivating factors for us to write our book is to bring attention to how images played a role in that story. I mean, how did we get to a point where we were able to take a territory that had been stewarded by the United States on behalf of the United Nations and decide that this was an acceptable use of that stewardship to use it as a bombing site, as a test site, as you said, as a site for really human experimentation. And I think we learned from indigenous scholars who are, I think, the highest authority in this. We learned that the depictions of the people, the depictions of the lands, play a key role in their rendering as as disposable and as other. What do you see as the larger danger when films are made by the government not only to document, but to dramatize an issue, in this case, the nuclear issue? I think that one of the larger dangers is certainly the way in which the mushroom cloud becomes kind of cliche, such that there's hardly a Hollywood production over the last 30 or 40 years that involves, you know, world cataclysm that doesn't feature a mushroom cloud. And that mushroom cloud could be nuclear in the film in origin, or it could be some other, some extraterrestrial being that implodes and produces the equivalent of a mushroom cloud. But that kind of familiarity, that kind of cliche, desensitizes us to the realities. And I think that that is... On the one hand, a very effective way to manage, and I use that in the most uh, almost insidious way, to manage populations. But clearly, from you don't even have to speak from any kind of perspective of democracy. You can just say from a human perspective. We don't want to be desensitized to these things, do we? And so I think one of the dangers here is the way in which film is part of a major part of the way in which we have become desensitized to nuclear issues. I think it comes back to history as well. I think something of that desensitization is happening 
as a result of those mushroom clouds getting edited over and over again and taken out of their context. I mean, we know the most famous montage of all of these, right? At the end of Dr. Strangelove, mm -hmm. we see, see one after another, and we actually don't know what led up to that for each of those particular explosions. We don't know the calculated decisions about which sites in the desert, which islands were going to be uh, lost through those pieces. We don't know the cost. I think it's about taking it out of, out of the history. Uh, that's where these films take us. There's another aspect that we haven't gotten into, and that is that the camera operators and other technicians who are actually on site to shoot these films, sometimes from very close up, they were exposed to the blast, to the radiation, to the fallout. Has there been any kind of health study or follow-up done on these individuals? Part of how we know anything we know at all about the Okada Mountain is because of a declassification effort that happened in the Clinton administration. And when the Cold War was deemed by some as over, it was at that time that the Energy Secretary, Hazel O'Leary, authorized the release of a lot of documents to help irradiated workers and veterans get access to the actual data about what they had been exposed to because they couldn't get to it before. And so if you look up some of these nuclear tests now and you look up for what documents are out there online, the first thing you're going to find are the reports that came out of that time that have tables and tables of exactly how much radiation different workers in the tests were exposed to. That's to say that that is not a test that was done later. That was data that was gathered at the time. That is to say that what was measured at the time was deemed to be acceptable. So in that case, what has been happening since has uh, would only have been uh, case by case, people seeking compensation, families seeking compensation uh, for what happened. And right now, though, we have talked to a number of the actual veterans and former photographers. We've not talked to any who were involved uh, in that kind of litigation. It would be interesting to find out if any of them are still alive. Well, when you look at how few are, of course, you wonder. And... Um, even some of the ones we've met along the way have since passed. And they're very glad to, to get together. The, the combat cameramen is the order to which they, they claim to belong. It's a broader kind of identity for themselves. And they gather, and they would be the ones to talk to about this, about who's still here and who's not and why. That's definitely a potential for our next program. Now, Lookout Mountain was closed down in July of 1969. Why then? And what happened to the archives? Who owns the copyrights? And how are the films and photos accessed today? Yeah, so why did Lookout Mountain close? That was a long process, uh, beginning really in the early 1960s uh, with the Kennedy administration and Robert McNamara and his um, incessant desire to try to centralize and make as efficient as possible, in his view, right, all the operations of the Pentagon, including the film operations. And so there was talk relatively early in, in the Kennedy administration about consolidating. There were other film units in the military across the country, none like Lookout Mountain, but there were other film units. So there was talk relatively early in the Kennedy administration about some sort of consolidation effort. So that's part of the story. Part of the story is that Hollywood was becoming a less and less convenient place for Lookout Mountain to be in the 1960s for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which was the Vietnam War. And you might say the way in which Hollywood turned from a kind of uh, Cold War consensus, a more center position politically in the 1950s, or even, you know, far out right position in the 1950s, to a more left position and, and anti-Vietnam politics and that sort of thing started to create some problems for Lookout Mountain in the 1960s. So, you know, there were a variety of reasons. It just became a less fruitful place in their eyes for them to be. And so eventually, as you said, in the late 60s, the operations were moved to another area, San Bernardino, is yeah, that right? San yeah, like Norton Air Force Base. Norton Air Force Base. And, and that was part of a more general consolidation effort. As far as the holdings, the issue is not copyright. 
The issue is classification. These are government products, right? And so they weren't privately owned. There is no real copyright law that covers them, but there's all kinds of security and classification laws that cover them. And so many of their holdings were sent to secure facilities. Some of them ended up sort of randomly in various places, including people that worked at Lookout Mountain taking stuff home. A lot of it was destroyed. And so the story of the archives is itself its own kind of quite messy story. And the fact that we were able to gather as much as we were able to over 10 years was partly um, just good sleuthing on our part and partly, you know, we hit some luck, to be honest. I mean, we, we ran into some people that put us onto some things that, that really helped our project. You know, maybe there's another story that might interest your listeners or aspect of the story that might interest your listeners in that one of the biggest surprises for us was to learn just how involved Lookout Mountain Laboratory was in Vietnam. By the time they closed there in the late 60s, they were as big as they'd ever been. And there were hundreds and hundreds of photographers and support workers for that effort that were going back and forth to Southeast Asia. And at that time, Lookout Mountain had become known not just for producing slick Hollywood-style uh, narrated films, but for being the most efficient deliverers of visual documents, visual evidence of military operations. And so they were documenting all the bombing in, in Vietnam and all the Agent Orange work and whipping those, that footage around uh, back and forth across the ocean to measure it, to evaluate it in what it was increasingly a data-driven enterprise as war was becoming. And so in many ways, the closure of Lookout Mountain was a part of the Pentagon learning of the value of images as data and an absorbing of what was a very specialized operation into a capacity that the Pentagon today does with just about every piece of its being. It's now a whole, as part of almost everything they do. With the declassified films, because I know they show up all over YouTube and I've seen so many of them, are they accessible to the general public? Can they be used? Are they under public domain now? Yeah, they're under public domain. And we've cataloged every film we can find online or that we have even found and digitized put online. We've put on our website, lookoutamerica.org. And they're all public domain. Now, sometimes folks are acquiring these films and restoring them and releasing copyrighted versions of them in high resolution. Uh, that's a different story. But Partly the reason why you see these things popping up in YouTube edits all the time is because they're in the public domain. Our book that's full of images, we were able to do it part because so many of those images are in the public domain. What has been the response to your book so far, both in the general reading public, in the academic community, and with the University of Illinois having such a large nuclear engineering department to some of perhaps your neighbors on campus? Each one of those audiences that you just described uh, tends to operate in their uh, sort of according to their own sense of time and timeliness. I would say that when our book was first released, we spent a lot of our time in a really wonderful way doing podcasts and um, radio interviews. And we've entertained some conversations with documentary film producers. And so, you know, there's been more than anything else that I've done in my career. This has certainly been a, a public-facing project and one that's gotten a fair amount of public reception. Uh, the Smithsonian just released a documentary a couple of months ago that features a lot of our work in it from this book. And so uh, the academic world just operates at a different pace. The book in the academic world has only been out about seven or eight months. And so that's still almost a kind of forthcoming book in, in the academic world. It's still hardly out right now. So we're, we're waiting to see what happens in the academic world with our work. And we really do hope that it gets taken up. Kevin might want to speak to that more. We have some hopes of seeing this out to a broader audience in film form, for sure. We think there's a lot of ways to tell the story that reflects some of the values and the critical concerns that have come up in our conversation here with you. You mentioned the nuclear engineers, and that's a really interesting point that not many people have asked us about. And we know some here on campus that are interested. They've invited us to come and screen some of these films and talk about them with them. Of course, 
as with any campus like this, where at some point in history, there were probably some Manhattan Project scientists here. We have some traditions here of really anti-nuclear physicists <laughs> that have been teaching with some of these films in their classes over the years to actually teach the students about the damages of these technologies. But maybe the most interesting piece of this is that we started to finally get a more conversation with the folks who are actually studying these films from the perspective of science at Lawrence Livermore. And that might be an interesting subject for your listeners to look into. These films are now under close scrutiny yet again out at Lawrence Livermore to actually correct some of the bad data, the ways in which these films resulted in data sets that were actually not serving nuclear engineering well. And so they're going back to these films to try to see if they got the data right for their science. And is there a department or an individual at Lawrence Livermore who is in charge of this? Yes, there is. His name is Greg Spriggs, and he is a, a nuclear scientist. And his project, which is in its own way quite fascinating, as he discovered as they began to digitize some of these films several years ago and use computers as opposed to humans to do things like try to measure blast radius or fireball circumference, they realized that many, many of the measurements from the 1950s were inaccurate, that there was all kinds of human error. And so the yield figures that we have in these documents that have been out there forever right now, many of them are wrong. So the films are becoming the basis for recalculating things like yield from these various tests. So it's AI technology, supercomputing technologies, all of that is are coming back to bear on these films in, in ways that who would have thought it 15 years ago? Everything old is new again, unfortunately, including the arms race. <laughs> Correct. If People wish to purchase your book, and I would encourage them to do it because it is a fascinating read. We've barely scratched the surface here with this interview. Where can they go to access the book? They can buy our book, Look Out America, The Secret Hollywood Studio at the Heart of the Cold War, directly from University of Chicago Press on their website or from Amazon or from their local bookstore where they can request it uh, to come get delivered and support local booksellers. And you have a website that you've mentioned as well that I assume has other information on it? Yes, Levy. If people want to see more of the material on which we based our research on our, our book at lookoutamerica.org, you can see not only the films, but a lot of the documents that we used uh, to figure out exactly what was happening over the years there at the studio. So that's still an ongoing concern. We're putting up new things. We think there's a lot more work to do. We're just scratching the surface ourselves on this. Is there anything else that we have not gotten to that you think it's important to mention at this time? You know, one of the chapters of Lookout Mountain's history that we have not talked about, but I think your listeners would be very interested in, is the missile development program, which Lookout Mountain ended up being really, really integral to that whole project. So the, the way in which the nuclear weapons program shifted in the 1950s from uh, an airplane-based approach to a missile-based approach. And, and that was a transformation that took place in the Pentagon, but it was one that was quite fraught and one uh, where there was plenty of opposition within the Pentagon itself to missile development over bombers, using bombers in nuclear war. And Lookout Mountain ended up getting pulled into the middle of that in all kinds of really interesting ways that we discuss in the book. And so given the interest of your listening audience, we think they might want to turn to that missile chapter when they get the book and read up on that. It's also truly be that they ended up covering the development of early experimental nuclear reactors. So there are some films out there from a few that they were, they were out there documenting that might be of interest to some of your listeners who are studying some of the particular cleanup sites and that sort of thing. They might find some documents of landscapes that they know all too well. As we're getting to a conclusion here, I would just say that I think one of our biggest hopes here is that we are able to ignite and catalyze conversations about the roles that images play and that moving images play in these critical, critical debates, whether they're about uh, what happened in the past or what's happening in the present, whether it's the current arms race or even the climate crisis.
you clearly made an important, valuable, and lasting contribution to our understanding of the whole nuclear landscape. And the research you have done strikes me as being critical. And I know that listeners are going to be looking this up because that's the kind of people they are. For now, I want to thank the two of you, Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman, for the marvelous book that you wrote and also for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's been our pleasure to be here, Libby, and thank you to your listeners as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Kevin Hamilton and Ned O'Gorman are the authors of Look Out America, the secret Hollywood studio at the heart of the Cold War. Their website is lookoutamerica.org, and it contains a treasure trove of links to films and documents directly taken from the Lookout Mountain Laboratory, as the studio was known. To learn more about the bombing of the Marshall Islands, I strongly suggest you view the film I mentioned, Nuclear Savage, by Adam Jonas Horowitz. We will have a preview of that movie up on the website for this episode, NuclearHotSeat.com, number 430. We'll link to the film Operation Ivy and also the article on how Marilyn Monroe came to briefly be part of Lookout Mountain's work. And just for fun, for those of you who may have been too young to have remembered Dr. Strangelove, We'll link to the film's ending, with the scene in the government bunker leading to the bomb-blastic finish. All will be available on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 430. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 17, 2019. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat is now available on all your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. So however you prefer to listen to your podcast, you'll find us there, and we've got tabs connecting you at the top of the website landing page. And after a bit of delay, finally, a shout-out and a welcome to KNIZ listeners, 90.1 in Gallup, New Mexico, the latest broadcast station to carry Nuclear Hot Seat every week. Thanks to everyone for listening, for caring, and for joining the Nuclear Hot Seat listeners and followers around the world in 123 countries on six continents and counting. If you want to get Nuclear Hot Seat delivered via email every week, it's easy. Go to the website, scroll down for the big yellow box, and sign up for the weekly email link. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. And if you appreciate weekly verifiable news updates about nuclear issues around the world, take a moment to send a donation of any size to NuclearHotSeat.com. We will really appreciate your support. This episode of Nuclear Hot Seat is copyright 2019, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that there is no such thing as a limited nuclear war. The effects are limitless, devastating, and last forever on this one little planet that we all share. There you go. You have just had your nuclear wake-up call, so do not go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.